Chapter 8 Emergency Summit Fenn's liver-spotted hands wandered over the selection of blades, sharp edges sending glittering invitations his way. He pondered. Which to choose? He could pick the largest knife, ideal for carving away large sections of the target, but he had only recently used it on his subject, rendering another use so soon redundant. How about the smaller, thinner blade? Perfect for jobs requiring more finesse. Then again, his current patient was already well worn down. An even more delicate tool was required. Ah, there it is. He laced his fingers around the handles and pulled the set of scissors from their resting place at the edge of his collection, twin blades freshly sharpened from last week's session. Fenn raised his head, stared straight into the face of his victim. A set of unwavering, grey eyes gazed back. He thought the eyes might be mocking him, for he sensed a hint of jollity in them which neither he nor the years that passed had yet managed to kill. Good to see something still left. Fenn raised the scissors and snipped. He watched the single hair tumble in the mirror's reflection before landing amongst its brethren in the sink. He continued to cut away at his beard, shearing the loose bristles threatening its shape. He trimmed the wispy moustache gathered on his upper lip, accompanied by a triangle of hair under the bottom ending in a pointed dagger hanging off his chin in the classic Van Dyke style. He lowered the scissors and studied his beard, stark white in colour, identical to the thin cropping of hair atop his head. Rather dashing for a man in his mid-forties, even with the lack of colour. Fenn took a moment to admire the pristine edges of his beard, kept under strict control for another day. The one area in his life that he, and he alone, kept under his purview. A loud banging at the door interrupted his thoughts. Fenn sighed and turned from the sink to face the rest of his bedroom. Now this is an area I've long given up trying to keep control. He thought to himself, as he picked his way through the mess of clinking beer bottles, tangled wires from outdated knickknacks, ancient books whose undisturbed pages had begun to colour, and finally, through the swath of dirty clothes he'd managed to hoard for years of prowling the city. Another set of bangs, louder this time. A light knock would have sufficed. Did this person think he couldn't hear them? Perhaps they thought him lost amongst the many vast chambers contained within the tiny room. Fenn scraped a pair of brown corduroy trousers off the floor. The I Heart NW t-shirt he was wearing would have to do. I hear you, I hear you, so stop your incessant pounding, you impatient bass. Ah, Tonkai, how are you doing? Tonkai, a stocky, short-set man with stubble passing as a poor excuse for hair, glared at him, left eye twitching. Fenn, Tonkai, Fenn repeated. Try to smile. I see you're back from Shankmora. Nice weather, I hope. Better than here, I'm sure. I swear, it hasn't been this bad since... Cut the shit, Fen. I'm not here for small talk. Typical Tonkai. Brusque as always. Fen smiled, settled into a frown, as he leant against the doorframe. Just beg talk, then. What about? What do you think? Tonkai spat, quite literally, and Fen made an obvious point of wiping the spittle from his cheek. Dead. A fucking hollow cloak dead, and are you and that other idiot's watch? Fenn marvelled at the way Tonky's accent managed to be as blunt as its owner's square head, while simultaneously as sharp as one of his razors. Do you know how suspicious this looks, Fenn? And of course, it's neither of your two's fault. No, it's all some giant mud monster. Giant mud demon, Fenn corrected. If he was going to present a picture of the enemy he'd heroically fled from, then he might as well paint a good one. And now, on top of this gunship fiasco, we also have a dead holocloak on our hands. As if everyone wasn't on edge already. Did you not think how this would affect the clan? You mean affect your business? It was a lot harder to ship goods by renting the other clan's vehicles, with murderous intent in the air. My fault? Fenn asked, shifting himself from the doorframe. It could have easily been me, or the steelbreaker killed by that demon. I'm lucky to be alive. Tonkai gave a derisive snort. Good to know how concerned he is about my well-being. You are lucky. Lucky that ever idiot is still alive to corrupt. 
corrupt to confirm your story. Ha. Huh. Couldn't even say corroborate. Hardly a big celebration, no. Tonkai was still the boss, and Fen still sober. Tonkai's eyes flared at Fen's smirk. So, where's Billy and Oscar? Fen asked, moving on before he received another rant about respect. I thought they'd be the ones running to put out the diplomatic fires. They left for no man's land and won't be back for a few days. So, for now, I'm the one who has to handle this crisis you've caused. Gods. This very irritable, slightly psychotic stack of muscle was in charge of the Creevers? This really was a crisis. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that, Fenn said, swooping around his door and plucking a khaki coat from its hanger. He lost his raincoat when fleeing the demon, leaving him with only four khaki-coloured coats to choose from. Hard times indeed. He turned to find Tonkai glaring at him, left eyelid still jumping. He had hoped the man would be gone by now. Tonkai wasn't the sort for heartfelt goodbyes. Good. I see you get the picture. This way. The meeting's starting in twenty minutes. Meaning? Fen asked as Tonkai marched down the corridor. Damn. He'd been planning on going to the tavern. Fen locked his door. Padlocked, to be more precise. Like hell was he paying for a locksmith. He rushed along the corridor, filled with doors of varying quality that led into other bedrooms he suspected were all bigger than his own. So, Fen panted as he caught up to Tonkai, dreading the answer to his next question. Who are we meeting with? Tonkai gave a sigh, far too exasperated for such a sensible question. The other clan chiefs, who else? Marie has called the three involved clan chiefs and the two fools out on patrol with the hollow cloak. That means you. Fen groaned. Great. An afternoon of high politics. The highest politics in this place, anyway. He had managed to avoid these meetings, flying under the radar of responsibility, as he liked to phrase it. He'd lost his appetite for pointless squabbling long ago, but it always seemed to find a way back to him, sooner or later. Why don't you have a gauntlet? Tonki asked as they walked. It's a pain coming all the way down here to fetch you. Well, get me a room in the clan quarters and you'll have a much shorter trip. They're reserved for important Kruver members. Not you. This way. Really? Through the exit? Who would have thought? He was treated to a lovely sight of Tonkai's arse as they climbed the ladder to the hatch leading onto the surface. As Fen struggled to heave himself off the last rung, he couldn't decide what was more depressing, climbing through a hole to start the day, or descending into one to finish it. Standing on top of the underground apartments, Fen stretched his complaining back, rotating his chest left and right, squinting in the harsh daylight that might have looked drab to someone without a hangover. He was ringed in by tall brick walls, whichever way he looked, adorned with stocky, cylindrical turrets, each equidistant from its neighbour. Good castles took years to build, and this one had been slapped together in a few of them, leading to leagues of haphazardly misplaced bricks, skewed staircases and wonky balustrades, but at least all the bricks were the same rust-red colour. He currently stood next to the base of a turret, its massive girth casting him in deep shadow, while the furthest part of the wall, the section drawing a line between fort and sea, sat half a kilometre away. Yep, still the same old jagged fort. Interrupting the historic brick decor were three identical skyscrapers lined along the right-hand side of the fort, easily twice the height of the wall encasing them, plain white on the sides, fronts and backs covered in a sheen of windows. From his current angle, Fenn saw how the sides of the skyscrapers got narrower towards their slanted tops. The sole survivors of what used to stand here before Arminius cleared the site on moving day. He didn't have time to admire the sight atop the three skyscrapers today, as Tonkai had already turned towards the hive of activity to their left, and Fen's biggest obstacle of each day. The courtyard. It held a jostling mess of ships that landed amongst trucks and cars, being unpacked and loaded on the spot, before taking off again into the crowded airspace. Men squeezed between them, carrying supplies or trying to look useful, while shouting merchants flitted around, buying and selling to anyone worth bothering, divided again by streams of residents being taxied amongst the pandemonium. Every man, woman and vehicle wrestled for space amongst the chaos, keen to get their work over and done with, being held up or holding up others in the process as everyone prioritised themselves, slowing the whole machine to a monotonous churn. There was no queuing culture to be found here. 
Tonkai wasn't headed for the scramble, but rather to a small line of parked vehicles, the closest thing this side of the fort had to a taxi rank. Way to go, Tonkai! I forgot you had your own ride. Tonkai shot Fen a rare smile, as susceptible to flattery as anyone else. The perks of wealth, my friend! He made for a large motorbike, polished to a gleam, two huge silver exhausts complementing the shiny black body sitting atop a mighty set of tyres. Nice ride, Fen said casually, holding back his excitement. He'd be clinging on to the back of Tonkai as they rode, but that didn't matter. The bike looked like it packed a large punch he was eager to try. If I'm not mistaken, that's a cruiser. Tonkai glanced at the bike. Actually, it's a power cruiser. Best play it cool and pretend I know something about bikes. What size engine we talking? Tonkai shrugged. Don't know. Don't know? What motorbike owner doesn't? Oh no. Tonkai walked straight past the lustrous bike and clambered into the next vehicle, if you could call it that. He leaned out the side. There's no room up front. You'll have to get in the back. Fen gawked at the free-wheeled scooter cased in a dull green and yellow body, headlight hanging off the front with its back wires on display. Is that a tuk-tuk? No, it's an auto rickshaw. More practical than any of those ridiculous bikes. Now get in! It's a bloody tuk-tuk, Fen mumbled as he sidled into the back seat, old leather squelching. He had thought, or dared to hope, that all these boxy mopeds had been destroyed in the APOC. Seemed someone didn't do a proper job. Fen was surprised to hear the old engine splutter to life. Tonkai urged the tuk-tuk forward, trundling over gravel constructed by crushing the previous building standing in its place. Fen dismissively surveyed his surroundings, like a surly housewife being taken out for a Sunday drive, as Tonkai weaved between converted gunships and shouting peddlers, looking comical as he raced a lumbering truck in his motorised box. Fen had to give Tonkai credit. They were making good pace as they darted through gaps in the crowd, leaving the larger cars in their wake. They only stopped once, when a stolen hoverback helicopter landed directly in front of them, twin rotor blades kicking up dust, and angry shouts from the shawled woman it nearly squashed. She started hurling stones from the gravel floor, pelting the cockpit where a red-faced pilot flipped her off, but refrained from exiting his protective bulletproof casing. Tonkai honked his horn, blasting an unhelpful blare into the clamour surrounding them. Fen stifled a yawn as they slipped under the hoverback's tail. You could get bored of anything if you saw it every day. They finally reached some sense of calm on the other side of the courtyard, where Tonkai parked in a much longer taxi rank, one of the few areas patrolled by Arminius's men. They were directed to a park between a hijacked NWCD patrol car and a dirty white van, the type that gave off child abduction vibes. More gravel crunched underfoot as they walked towards the keep. Three layers of walls and spiked ramparts in a classic wedding cake shape with red brick icing. No windows or peepholes occupied the ground level, but as Fen looked up at the looming battlements, he spotted various cannon and artillery protruding from between the bastions. All various makes and design. You tended not to be picky when you didn't build the weapons yourself. I sold them that one! Tonkai boasted, pointing to an anti-aircraft cannon, its four barrels protruding upwards, looking as likely to stab the air as to shoot at it. Fen was no expert, but even he knew the gun with flaking orange paint was a charger-type weapon. Good job, Fen grumbled, making sure not to ask any follow-up questions that risked starting a conversation about Tonkai's arms business. They stepped through the keep's black double doors, riddled with metal rivets and plating, and passed two of Arminius's guards. They leant against the doors, blaster rifles hanging by their sides, lazily scanning the crowd. The ruckus outside shrank to idle chatter as they entered the warm air of the keep, where overhead bulbs cast a dim light on the spacious interior. Yet more red bricks lined the hallway. Arminius really did like a consistent theme. If only he cared half as much about consistent organisation, then Fen wouldn't have to wrestle through lost, jabbering crowds in the courtyard each morning. At the centre of the keep's ground level, they were presented with a five-way choice. To their left lay the corridors for the canteen and the fighting pits. To their right, the brothel. And then, Fen's personal favourite, the tavern. There was a woeful lack of signs for the identical-looking corridors. 
I should really label the damn things and stop lost fighters and sex pests from wandering into the tavern. Fen followed Tonkai towards option number five, the stairs. They passed two more of Arminius's guards, who somehow managed to look even more bored than the pair outside. One gave him a suspicious look, but made no indication of stopping him, or of movement in general. Fen suddenly realised that he'd never been upstairs. Someone behind him must have noticed too. Oh, look at that! Fen's been promoted! Drunken jeers accompanied the taunting. Sounded like a few regulars had already beaten him to the tavern. Friends of yours? Tonkai asked accusingly, his left eye nearly collapsing into itself at such a concept. That's a generous term for them, Fen said. Without turning, he held up a solitary middle finger behind his back. That got a chorus of laughter from below, and another glare from Tonkai. They passed more doors on the first level, which must have been either executive apartments or ammunition storage for the keep's weapons. Maybe both. Finally, and with a lot less breath, they reached the top level. Before them lay another set of black doors, a pair of guards, and the famed chief's chamber within. There he is, one of the guards remarked, although Fen had no idea who he was addressing. After you, Fen said. Of course, Tonkai snapped, parading forth and thrusting open the doors. Fen had been slightly curious to see the grand ruling parliament of the Jagged Keep, only to be disappointed as usual. A table ran the length of the room, accompanied by a line of lever chairs either side of it. It was identical to every other conference room in the world, another unpleasantness that hadn't been killed off by the APOC. At least this room had windows, unlike most of the keep. Half opened on to the ruined city beyond the walls, the other half out to sea. And yep, there they are. Arminius's banner and the original symbol to represent the freelancers hung at the far end of the room, behind the head of the table. It had a grey background, with a white side profile of a skull, a gear cog sticking out of its head. The other four clan insignias, all newly commissioned within the last year, hung from their own banners, spread out down the sides of the room. Fen didn't give them a second glance. They displayed the epitome of pomp and personal branding that made his stomach curl. Why do they have to draw even more lines between the clans like that? His illusion of the freelancers as a united community was crumbling year on year. So far, there were only two people sitting together at the far end of the room designed for at least twenty. As he approached, Fen recognised the closer man's dark skin and short afro instantly. A few ugly bruises had blossomed on his face where the recoiling blaster rifles hit him yesterday. Fen offered his hand. Hello again, Kotho. It's Kofi. Ah, shit. Always was terrible with names. It's good to see you, Kofi said, beaming and taking his hand. Good. At least he doesn't remember my... Fen. Damn. Why couldn't he have the courtesy to pretend he'd forgotten my name too? You're still in one piece, Fen? Hmm. Barely. I'm still a bit shaken, if I'm being honest. Coffee suddenly became serious. It was a very close call yesterday. Closer than that. After the mud demon's attack last night, Fen and Coffee hadn't stopped running until reaching the car. Fen had been jittery until driving far from the cursed block of skyscrapers, while Coffee took longer to recollect himself. He hadn't spoken until Fen dragged him from the car outside the fort's walls and told him the plan he'd whipped together. Time to see if Coffee played his part right. Do you have any idea what that thing was? Coffee asked, slight shake to his voice. That's why we're here, for others to tell us what we saw. He looked past Coffee, and a sudden pressure fell onto his shoulders as he locked eyes with Kenji Saburo, chief of the Steelbreakers. The man adjusted the spectacles, resting under his combed grey hair, soundlessly studying him. Fen's head began to churn, recalling snippets of conversation in the tavern. Saburo had a certain reputation, one that demanded respect. The obvious care he'd taken of his immaculate grey suit confirmed it. Mr. Saburo, I assume, Fen said, nodding. Nice to meet you. Saburo analysed him, probably listening for ridicule. I'd better come across as well-mannered. Fen had spent more than enough of his childhood being trained in the art of arse-kissing. Saburo finally nodded. 
Then, I believe, it is nice to meet you too. I only wished we met under more pleasant circumstances. The chief steelbreaker was very proper indeed. Saburo, Tonkai said as he trudged past. Fen, don't forget who you're here with. Fen smiled apologetically and followed Tonkai, admiring how someone could be so oblivious to established niceties. Or maybe he just didn't care. Fen took a seat at the table to Tonkai's left and directly across from Coffee and Saburu. It was one of those tables that disguised itself as being constructed from light brown wood to hide the cheap chipping stuffed inside. Just like any other conference room. Coffee and Saburu whispered in hushed tones across the table. Whispering. What a pain. Fen found it hard to hear what was being said, even when he was the recipient of such murmurings. Still, hushed tones were better than none. Tonkai sat wordlessly next to him, ignoring everyone in the room, buried in his smart gauntlet, and Fen crossed his arms, simmering at the silent treatment. Brisk steps began to trickle in from outside. The doors barely had time to crack open before the room's next visitor proclaimed, Hello, hello, how are we all doing? A small, thick-set woman waddled into the room, head bobbing above the chairs. Half-grumbled responses greeted her. Good, good. She didn't really seem to care. Fenn searched vague recollections of whom the woman, a bit older than himself, and her clan might be. She passed by the two steelbreakers and sat at the head of the table, between Saburu and Tonkai. Sitting underneath the banner, with a skull and its gear cog cap, the woman's identity suddenly clicked. Marie, second in command to Arminius and their clan, the gearheads. It seemed the rumours of Marie taking over as de facto caretaker of the freelancers weren't as absurd as Fenn had thought. So, Marie said, glancing at her gauntlet without opening it. The time shone on the gauntlet's outer screen as she did, resting atop the closed lid. We're still waiting for Hilda? Let's start without her, Tonkai said, snapping his own gauntlet shut. It's her fault she's late. Marie leant against the table, propping her head on her meaty clenched fist. She looked Tonkai up and down from beneath her shock of neck-length silver hair, fringe cast to one side. I take it Billy and Oscar are busy then? Fen had to stop himself from laughing. The skin beneath Tonkai's stubble reddened. I'll have you know, Marie, but I'm just as qualified at running our clan. Very gracious of Tonkai, saying our instead of my. Uh-huh. Marie glanced away, much to Tonkai's obvious annoyance. Glad to see you made it, Mr. Saburu. Saburu, quiet and measured. Of course, this is a very serious matter, of which Coffee is keen to clarify. Coffee! Marie leaned back in the chair, arms spread on its rests. You were one of the men on patrol? Coffee's eyes were darting, frantically analysing the room, in the same way he had done in the ruined reception lobby. He straightened. What? Oh, yes, yes. The patrol gave me quite a scare. You could say I was terrified. He smiled and winked, as if he'd told some in the no joke. Fenn couldn't figure out the man's thoughts. Everything about Coffee's words and expressions seemed a minute off. So I hear. And the other man? Dead. Yes, very dead. The one who didn't die? Oh, Fenn! Huh, he wasn't as scared as me, I believe. Coffee laughed and winked again. Why does he keep winking? Fen, was it? Fen stiffened as Marie looked his way. She had one of those staring sets of eyes that wasn't scared of holding long gazes. I've heard your name before. You're one of those wasters in the pub, aren't you? Good to see my reputation hasn't failed me. Someone's got to keep the owners in business, Fen said. He was saved the effort of chuckling to fill the silence by Coffee, who boomed with laughter, far too loud considering the tame joke. Marie lounged in her chair, waiting for Coffee's echoing chortle to finish. With he as well? I can see why you're in Billy's clan. Fenn refrained from mentioning that he'd never met his own clan chief, Billy. After all, the Creevers were the second biggest clan in the Freelancers, and that meant having several hundred members in its ranks. Of course, Fenn preferred the anonymity. To his relief, Marie's penetrating stare swivelled to the chamber's opening doors. This meeting was meant to be kept small? 
The other clans have two members present, so it's only fair I bring a second. After all, it seems I'm short one man. Fen had no trouble identifying this newcomer. Hilda Roth, chief of the Hollowcloaks. Her long red hair winnowed about her sour face as she snapped her gaze from one man to the next before settling on Marie. The woman was standing, but her head barely came over the table. And he'd fought Marie on the short side. Hilda must have been at least head and shoulders shorter than Fen. Starting a little early, aren't we? I don't see why. You can't get anything done right without me. Hilda's physical size was minuscule compared to her attitude. Says the one who's late, Marie replied distractedly. Now hurry and sit so we can get this show on the road. What's your words? These men have killed one of my own. I demand... Yes, yes, we're getting to that. Marie started clicking her fingers, bracelets on her arm jangling. Come on now, quick meeting's a good meeting. Not many people got away with talking to Hilda like that. Fenn had to admire Marie's imperative manner, and he had to admire himself for knowing a word as fancy as imperative. Hilda narrowed her eyes and flared her nose at Marie. She stubbornly looked away like a petulant child, lips pursed, and strode to the chair next to coffee. She sat herself rather close to the nervous-looking man. What's wrong? she asked, leaning across and nearly biting Coffee's face off as she spoke. If you've done nothing wrong, then there's no need to look so scared. Fen was amazed such a scant, pale woman could produce so much noise. Thank goodness she didn't sit on my side of the... A figure fudded into the chair on Fen's left. He slowly turned and had to resist pushing away from the table, gliding to safety on his wheelie chair from the huge, glaring man. Where Hilda had been small, this man was the opposite, excessively so. At least a head. No, two heads taller than Fen. The man's black, bald scalp glistened with sweat, and two rings of white poked out from the surrounding dark skin in a beam far more intense than Marie's. You've heard of me. The rumbling words vibrating around Fen were stated, not asked. It took a great deal of effort for Fen to appear calm, as if he was accustomed to conversing with giants that looked like they wanted to tear his head off. I might have. You're Bingo, aren't you? Master of the fighting pits, or whatever's written on that sparkly belt. Bingo leant forward, and Fen willed himself to stay stationary, hoping his bobbing Adam's apple wasn't too noticeable. I have to say, I'm surprised to see you with your chest actually covered for once. Bingo paused his snarling and stared down at his green and brown camo shirt, taken aback by the comment on his clothes, just as Fen hoped. Outlandish phrases proved remarkably helpful in throwing someone's anger. Bingo's head whipped back up. Want to see me shirtless? Then let us fight. In the pit! And show off my own hairy chest. I wouldn't want to subject you to such an ungainly sight. Bingo was interrupted before he could respond. Back off, you! Only grown-ups can speak at this table. Tonkai, always the diplomat. What did you say? Bingo leapt up, a landslide in reverse. Bingo! Hilda growled warningly. Tonkai rose to the challenge, making up for the smaller height by squaring his shoulders and puffing out his chest. Fan shrank in his chair. He always got a shit hand in long-tabled seating arrangements. Enough! A hand cracked on the table. Everyone looked to Saburo, a furnace burning in his eyes. You are both acting disgraceful. Show some decorum to one another. Fight if you insist, but do it outside, in the proper fashion, like gentlemen. Gentle was the last word you could attach to this pair, but still, they settled back down, Tonkai with the most indignant glower now. Fen sighed. He should have chosen the seat next to the exit. Marie still lounged in her chair, elbow nestled on the left rest to support the hand resting against her face. She nodded her thanks to Saburo, whose eyes had already settled back to calm pools underneath the surface of his glasses. Now then, dick's properly measured. How about we get started? Started? Hilda asked. Without Arminius? He's still in charge, is he not? Arminius won't be joining us. He's currently... Marie waved her hand through the air, fishing for the right word. Unavailable. Not to mention madder than a Mercurian plant worker. A few eyes shifted around the room, leaving a pause. No one raised further objections to their glorious leader's absence. After all, it meant one less raving lunatic to deal with. Marie filled the silence by tapping the console built into the right armrest of her swivel chair. 
A blob of white light sprang into existence, mid-air above the table. Fan swore and jumped back from the sudden apparition, earning a chuckle from coffee. He squinted at the dazzling floating light, and trailed his eyes down to the table's inbuilt projector. What's that supposed to be? Tonkai complained. Bear with, bear with, Marie tapped the console. The brightness is too high. The image darkened to form distinct white lines, morphing into rectangles, and finally a jumble of skyscrapers hovering above the table. A highly built-up city block. Coffee whistled. Can you change the colour as well? I wish. This projector was appropriated. Marie waved her hand dismissively. From some faction or other. Whoever uses white colours. Reformists, Tonkai grunted. And I've got the best weapons, if you're interested. Marie wasn't. Well, there you go. And what city, exactly, are we looking at? Thank goodness Tonkai wasn't afraid to utter the very question Fan felt too self-conscious to ask in front of this unsympathetic gathering. He copied the smug looks Hilda and Bingo swapped over the table, abruptly dropping the smirk when Tonkai glanced his way. It's this city. Marie flourished one of her many waves towards the row of windows facing the island. The wall's red bricks blocked most of the view, but the tips of a few taller skyscrapers peeked over the spiky top, looking in much worse condition than their counterparts glowing above the projector. This is the last model of the city mapped before the APOC, so you can ignore that whole section. Marie gestured at a clump of towers that only resembled the fort's current position due to the three skyscrapers that currently overlooked Fenn's deluxe bedroom complex. He recognised a few of the more intact buildings from his patrols of the city, dotted in various places, but other than that, the map was next to useless. Most of the buildings had either been destroyed or massively damaged, and Vanver was the clutter of demolished roads and wrecks, especially the massive spydroid in the centre of the city, that were absent from the image. Everyone still stared at the hologram, as if something else was going to happen, so Fan took an opportunity to speak, eager to get the meeting over with. Can I propose explaining my side of the story first? Propose? Tonkai spat. What is this, a bloody court hearing? Whose side is he on anyway? I agree, Bingo chimed in from Fen's other side. This man cannot be trusted. Who's he agreeing with? No one mentioned my trustworthiness. So what? I'm not allowed to speak? You? Ideally, no. Oh great, now Hilda's joining in on the witch hunt. Then what am I supposed to- Might I propose? Coffee, speak first. It seems the easiest way to cross this impasse. Saburu, with no great effort, had captured everyone's agreement. Even Tonkai nodded, seemingly happy with Saburu's use of the word propose. The favouritism amongst this lot was unbelievable. Fen fumed as Marie spoke. So then, Coffee, seems you're going first. Hopefully Coffee followed the plan laid out for him yesterday, otherwise they were both screwed. Marie flipped open her gauntlet. According to the guards, you reported to the Eastern Gate at 1627. The three of you were checking for gunship activity in the eastern part of the city. While stopping for lunch, you were attacked by a... mud monster. Mud demon. Marie shot Fen a glare before continuing. This monster proceeded to not only kill Bram, but also apprehend... She paused. Apprehend? Seriously? I thought the word provided some nice ceremony to the story. To apprehend three blaster rifles, two cases of blaster cells, and one sentimentally valued coat. Hopefully someone's going to refund me for it. Now! Marie whipped her arm back, snapping the gauntlet shut. The guards reported you both reeked of booze. You were on the drink, during patrol, despite Arminius's recent orders? You mean morally bankrupt prohibition? Fenn caught Coffee's eye, cast the briefest of nods. Coffee sat up, and despite only wearing a t-shirt, pulled at its loose neckline as if to relieve some stress. Drink? Yes, well, I'm not going to deny that we might have partaken in the substance. Coffee glanced over again. But I did not bring any alcohol myself. In fact, the only one who brought a drink was Bram. Fen refrained from whipping. He insisted that we take some of his drink or else he'd hit us. Bullshit. Bingo rained his fist on the table, coffee the new focus of his fiery hatred. 
Bram would never have done such a thing. Coffey avoided the man's gaze, staring resolutely at the white city. Patrolling that ghostly city can change even the greatest of men. What a great saying. Fenn was glad he'd given it to Coffey yesterday. Hilda shot Coffey a glare that could cut diamonds. You're taking the piss telling us that shit. All right, Hilda, you try writing a better line. Fenn, Marie inquired. He'd rarely had a more uncomfortable spotlight shone on him. Well, to be honest, I did see a new side of Bram yesterday. And as much as I hate to say it, if I didn't have a sip of his flask, I'm pretty sure Bram would have ripped off my beard and shoved it down my throat. Hmm, Saburu murmured, taken aback by the colourful revelation. It's a shame he didn't, you lying sack of shit. Fen wasn't winning any points with Hilda today. He held up his hands. As Coffee said, patrol changes. Hilda was past the point of listening. She leaned across the table, hands bunched into little fists. We all know who really brought drink out with them. She glanced down at Fenn's open jacket and wrinkled her nose. Clearly someone wasn't a fan of the I Heart NW shirt. You can take the man out of the tavern, but he'll still be a useless drunk. How had all the freelancer chiefs pegged him as a tavern local? He'd always thought these people stayed holed away in their respective clan headquarters, drinking expensive wine and eating fish eggs, or whatever it was fancy people did nowadays. Let's stop talking about who got who drunk. We already know the answer to that. What I want to know is, why did you kill Bram? Did Billy tell you to do it? Watch it, Tonkai snarled. We didn't do anything to him. It was Fenn's turn to raise his voice. It was the Mud Demon. Mud Demon? Hilda shook her head, red hair swinging hypnotically. Some creature just appeared, covered in mud, and killed Bram? Yes. It stabbed and strangled him right in front of us. We shot it. Twice. Then the creature collapsed and got back up again with these demonic blue eyes. Like a picture right out of a horror book. Ask Coffee. I can still hear him quaking in his boots. Huh? Two shots? Bingo snorted. Nonsense. No one could survive that. Well, like I said, this thing did. Then where is this creature? Hilda asked, sitting back in her chair and crossing her arms. Fenn resisted the urge to look under the table and see if her feet actually touched the floor. My man only got there late in the morning because you pair conveniently forgot where you abandoned Bram, leaving plenty of time for this boogeyman of yours to escape. I can never remember where I end up in that damn city, and Coffee's gauntlet was... I'm not finished. Cheeky bitch. You're asking us to accept your words after giving me no reason to trust you. Well, how can I... When you know that things here are already at a critical tension. That has nothing to do with... And now you're going to blame me for being suspicious of one of my top men being killed in the presence of two rival clans? What kind of inquiry is this anyway? Are we just going back and forth for fun now? We're getting nowhere. I agree, Marie cut in. Tonkai, do you have something to add? Oh no, don't get him involved. Let's see, Tonkai said, slowly stroking his chin, savouring the limelight. I've had a few cases like this during my time, selling weapons. Fenn rolled his eyes and heard Coffee snicker across the table at his exasperation. Even Saburo let out an annoyed sigh. Officially, or at least between parties big enough to call themselves official, factions could not directly sell to one another. That's where Tonkai came in, acting as a middleman for weapons and ammunition between the bigger factions down south, skimming a profit off the top in the process. An impressive feat to be sure, and the very reason he'd bought such a high position within the Kruvers. However, Tonkai managed to ruin any good reputation gained from this venture by mentioning his trade in every other conversation. Between meals and calls, from orders given to news delivered, Tonkai always found time to describe exactly how well his wares were selling and how his list of contacts flourished, transforming his respectable accomplishment into a running joke, shared amongst everyone at the fort, apart from himself. When parties disagreed on something the other had been accused of, Tonkai continued, oblivious to the derision, we settled the issue by finding evidence, for without evidence, everything is just hearsay. Good for Tonki, outlining the most basic precedent of any legal proceeding. 
Why is Coffee nodding along with that admiring look, as if Tonky's banal observation is a slice of sagely revelation? Very well, then. Saburu took his glasses off and rubbed at the already spotless lenses. If what Coffee and Fen say is true, then we must find this mud-clad attacker and deal with the threat. And if we find nothing, we shall reconvene under new light, where calmer tempers will prevail. Fine, but be ready, Saburo, because if there's no demon, the new steelbreakers and the Kruvers will have to pay. Saburo wordlessly met Hilda's gaze. Does that work for you? Marie asked Tonky. Yes. As if Tonky has the authority to speak for the Kruvers. Great. Then Fen and Coffee will take part in the search and tell us if we've found our mysterious mud friend. Looks like they weren't getting a say in the matter. Marie tapped the console built into her chair's arm, and the map, still hovering above the table, enlarged and split into two copies, flipping so both sides of the room were treated to a bird's eye view of the city streets. Ah, Coffee marvelled. I thought that might be for more than just a light show. Shush. Now, I say we send out three groups to search the city from east to west. One group takes the northern sweep, one in the middle, and one south. Marie dragged her finger across the console's touchscreen, drawing three lines on the hologram to illustrate her point. Fenn didn't like the image. Even with drone assistance, those three lines still left a lot of ground uncovered. And if we don't find the demon? Well... That's not good news for you, is it? If those two are coming on the search, Bingo said, then I insist I lead the party with both of them in it. New rules are in place. As long as every party has members from each of the top three clans, that's fine by me. What? Join a party led by this vindictive tank of a man? Surely that was a joke gone wrong. Fenn gave Tonkai an appealing look, but his compassionate boss only shrugged. I approve, as long as I lead one of the other parties. Typical. Fenn wished everyone would stop saying parties, as if giving the task of searching for a blood-crazed maniac in an abandoned city a fun festive bow. Mr. Saburo, can one of your lot lead the third party? Good. Then shall we begin the search at dawn? Rising at dawn would be a pain in the ass, but if he started getting up earlier each morning, then by next week, what date? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Fenn exclaimed. A set of unimpressed faces turned to him. Is that a problem, Fenn? Marie asked, in a tone that said it better not be. Not at all, Fenn grumbled, cursing the productive side of these higher-ups. I'll just have to make some extra arrangements. I'll have to drink a pint of water before bed to quell tomorrow's hangover. Make sure you do. Right, then. If that's us, shall I call this meeting over? Over? No one had even mentioned the gunship spotting, the one that started this whole debacle in the first place. Oh well, Fenn was as eager to get away as the currently departing clan chiefs. He turned to leave and found his path blocked by Bingo, who grinned down at him with teeth alone. See you tomorrow, friend. Fenn shook his head as the mass of bulking back muscles fudded away. If that man was a metre shorter, and I a metre taller, then... He'd still win in a fight. Coffee! Fan called as the rest of the room filed out the door. Coffee turned, one eyebrow raised. Fancy heading for a drink? The man beckoned, and Fen, who was already next to him, awkwardly sidled closer. Coffee leaned in with a stern look. I'm afraid I can't, Fen, he said in a sinister tone. Maybe he was angry at the lies Fen had forced him to be a part of. Coffee took a deep breath, and suddenly broke into a large, shining smile. I quit alcohol. Feng gasped. He had been right about the sinister intention. Quit? You were drinking enough. Feng caught sight of Hilda and Bingo still close by, and leant in, matching Coffee's conspiratorial distance. You were drinking enough yesterday. I know, Coffee whispered, placing a hand on Feng's shoulder. I also quit yesterday. After that whole Bram incident, I've decided to take a new path. Don't tell me you've turned to religion. Coffee leant back and gave a booming laugh. No, no, Fen. I'm going to run. Run? Yes, every day, 
around the fort, maybe even outside it. I'm off for a jog right now. It gives you an appreciation for your surroundings and all the secrets they contain. Even in this shithole? Fen asked, half jokingly, half truthfully. Even in shit, there are kernels of corn to be found. What a disgusting analogy. Another laugh. I encourage you to come along, Fen. It's time to take care of our bodies. We're not so young anymore, you and I. You barely look twenty-five, Fem muttered as Coffee hurried towards Saburu's stern look from the corridor. What was with him? One near-death experience, and Coffee had become a reformed man. If Fen did the same, he'd be a bloody saint by now. But that would run the risk of having an airport named after him. And who the hell wanted that on their reputation?